uh, uh, Moses' brother Aaron, the people were calling upon him to do something. They said to me, make us Elohim. Make us gods, if we're reading that in English. Who shall go before us? You know, that's when Aaron made the golden calf. Make us gods to go before us. The term Elohim is used more than 2,000 times in the Old Testament. And it's used interchangeably with the God of the Bible and the numerous gods of the pagans. For example, in the book of Exodus chapter 20, in what we know as the Ten Commandments, I want you to notice how that term is used. The Bible says, beginning in verse 2, I am the Lord your Elohim, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other Elohim. You shall have no other, look at your Bible, gods before me. And so the Bible speaks of more than, than one. But my question is, how can that be? Does the Bible contradict itself? There's one, and yet there's more than one? Well, the answer to that is no. There are three distinct personalities of deity. Three distinct personalities of deity. Now, the most, the probably the easiest place, or at least one of the easiest places to see that, is found in the book of Matthew 28 at verse number 19. The Bible says there, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of, by the authority of, if you will, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, we've got three distinct personalities that are mentioned there. It wasn't until about 260 A.D. You know, that's uh, over 200 years too late. But it was in about A.D. 260 that Sibelius denied the doctrine of God having three distinct personalities. See, Sibelius talked about a unipersonal God. And he said, the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost merely designate the same person with three different capacities. You know what? There's still religious organizations today, denominations that affirm this oneness doctrine, and it's not our purpose today to talk about those folks, but it is to talk about the, the Bible. Those today, though, still, like Sibelius, teach that as the Father, God created the world. As the Son, He redeemed the world. And as the Holy Ghost, He sanctifies the elect. That's their basic doctrine. They aren't persons, but they're one taking on different roles. I simply would call your attention to the Word of God. The Bible always explains itself better than any man can. In the book of Matthew chapter 3, if you have your Bible with you, turn there and look at verses 16 and 17. The Bible talks about the baptism of Jesus. It says this in the reading, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming uh, to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Three things that we need to note there. Number one, it was Jesus who was baptized, was it not? We have Jesus going to John. We have John having a discussion with Jesus before he actually baptizes him, and then it's Jesus who is baptized. But it's Jesus who is baptized and who is still standing there when he looks and he sees the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God coming down from heaven and resting upon him. Now wait a minute. For at least a time we have... Two, don't we? We have Jesus who is standing there. We have the Holy Spirit who is descending from heaven. And so we have Jesus who was baptized. We have the Spirit of God, as he mentions it there, who descended from heaven. But wait a minute. 
While we're still there, we have a voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved son. Who was speaking from heaven? Well, if he's talking about his son, we understand that it is the Father who is in heaven. Now, was the Holy Spirit just uh, doing a ventriloquist act? Was he uh, casting his voice back up into heaven because he's already resting upon Jesus? You see, we have three different distinct personalities, not, not one taking on different roles here. It's clearly laid out for us in the Word of God. And so we need to take God's Word for it. We need to take what the Bible has to say. There are other passages such as John 15 verse 26. But when the Helper comes, well, who's the Helper? Uh, He's going to go on and Jesus is. He's going to identify who the Helper is. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. you got Jesus talking about three distinct personalities. He talks about himself. He talks about the Father and he talks about the Son, or or, or the Spirit rather. Now each of these three, and there was your blank, the Father said, this is my beloved Son. Each one of these three personalities of what we sometimes refer to as the Godhead, uh, sometimes people will talk about the Trinity. That word is never used in Scripture, but the concept is, is there. All three of these personalities the, of the Godhead are eternal. And watch this. It's going to become important in a little while. Equal in essence. They're all eternal. That's what God is. He's able to be. He was here before the universe came to be. He's eternal. And they, all three are, and they're also equal in essence. They're all God. They're all God. Distinct personalities of the one God. The Father is God, Romans chapter 1 verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The Holy Spirit is God, according to Acts chapter 5 verse 3 and 4. You remember Ananias and Sapphira, those two, uh, those two people, they, uh, they uh, lied about some land that they had sold. And when Peter confronted them, he said to them, first of all, in verse number three, why do you lie to the Holy Spirit? Why do you lie to the Holy Spirit? But if you got your Bible, look at verse four. In verse number four, the Bible says, that uh, they uh, had not lied to man, but to God. And so the Holy Spirit is affirmed to be God. What about Jesus himself? Well, the Son is God as well. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word? Well, all you got to do is go down to verse number 14, and that Word became flesh. And he begins to keep talking about Jesus. And so, God the Father is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. And God the Son is God. Now these three different personalities work together to accomplish God's purpose. Whatever it was that God, these three distinct personalities, whatever it is that they wanted to accomplish, they all work together in perfect harmony to do that. As you think about that, I want you to think about God's purpose in creation. God's purpose in creation. Who created the world? Who created the world? Again, if you go back to the book of Genesis chapter 1 at verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But what does Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 say? Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Now what's special about His Son? Keep reading, verse number 2. 
whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Who created the world? Well, this passage affirms that God had a part, God the Father, but also that God the Son had a part in creating the world. But have you ever noticed Genesis 1 verse 2? What does verse 2 say in Genesis chapter 1? After saying that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Seems we have the Spirit who is there as well doing something and Job at least thought he was. In the book of Job, chapter 33, at verse number 4, Job affirms this, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. We have creative power resting in the Spirit of God as well. And so the point is, they all work together in perfect harmony to accomplish the purpose of God, to accomplish God's purpose in creating the world, the universe, as we know it. But you know what? It's not just creation in which they work together. What about our redemption? What about our salvation? Have they not worked in perfect harmony in regard to that as well? Now, you may have noticed this morning... uh, we had a long Bible reading, uh, verses 3 through 14 that, uh, that we had. Usually we have two or three verses that are read, but had a little bit longer one this morning. Why? Because Ephesians chapter 1 is one of the best outlines found in Scripture for the roles of each of the beings in the Godhead, for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it relates to our redemption, our salvation. When we look at that passage, we find verses 3 through 6 talking about what the Father did. We find verses 7 through 12 talking about what the Son did. And we find verses 13 and 14 talking about what the Holy Spirit did in regard to our salvation. I don't want to take time because our time is limited this morning to go back and read all of those verses again. But I want to highlight some things that are found in them. As we look at verses 3 through 6, we find that the Father's role was making and preserving the plans for our redemption. Notice beginning in verse 3 that God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, He did something. What did He do? Keep reading there. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He chose us, verse number 4, in Him before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Christ Jesus. What was it that God did? He planned. He came up with the plan that would save mankind. That's what's indicated to us by inspiration through the Apostle Paul. God the Father was the one who had the plan. What about verses 7 through 12? What was the Son's role? Well, Jesus' role was to enact the plans that God had made. Notice in verses 7 through 12, in Him we have redemption through His blood. Jesus came to die for us. The forgiveness of sin, uh, forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. In Him we have, verse 11, obtained an inheritance. You see, it's only through Jesus Christ that any of us can be saved. Only through what He did for us. No wonder then, back in the book of Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse number 12. The Father planned it. The Son enacted it. 
But what about the Spirit? Did He have a role as well? Absolutely. Verses 13 and 14. What was the role of the Spirit in our salvation? The Spirit's role was to seal the established plans. What does that mean, to seal the established plans? Well, look first of all at what He says. Verses 13 and 14. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit sealed the established plans. What does the word seal mean? The word used here means literally to stamp with a, with a signet ring or something of that nature. To stamp. And the reason it is, that it's stamped is for security and for preservation. In other words, when someone wrote a letter in years gone by, they didn't have one of these lick envelopes that you sealed it up. They didn't have one of these newfangled things you just peel the paper off, which is a whole lot better than having to lick that thing. What they had was a folded piece of parchment or paper of some sort, and they would take wax and they would melt the wax, and they would take the signet ring, and they would press it into the wax, and they would know that it hadn't been opened until it got to the right person. The Bible says the Spirit of God sealed our salvation. The idea is that not only was it security and preservation, but it was an attestation. In other words, it had, it testifies even to the fact of our salvation. When that word is used, it's used in Scripture in several places, such as Matthew 27, verse 66, when Jesus was crucified and put in the tomb. The Bible says about the Jewish leaders, they went and sealed, uh, or rather the Romans, that they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. They put the mark there. In John chapter 6 at verse 27, the Bible says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on Him God the Father set His seal. God attested to the fact that Jesus Christ is His Son, and it's through Him we have eternal life. But in reality, what is the idea? What's the concept of the Spirit's role in sealing the established plan of God. There are three basic ideas. Number one, and this is taught quite prevalently by many denominational bodies, that is simply this, that there is some direct operation of the Holy Spirit on God, of God on man's heart before he can become a believer. That the Holy Spirit somehow gives you a sign that you can be one of God's children. And they say before one can believe, the Holy Spirit performs His direct operation on the heart. But folks, did you pay close attention to what we read? Did you notice that these Ephesians, according to the passage that they believed, upon hearing the word, of God. And so in other words, first came their hearing of the word. And Paul even goes so far as to identify the word, the gospel of your salvation, verse 16, or 13 rather. The gospel. First came the hearing of the word, next came the believing, the obedience of the word. And it's only then that Paul reveals to us in that passage that they were sealed by the Spirit, verse number 14. The Spirit didn't come first and operate. The Word came first and operated. The hearts of the people was touched by the Word. They believed, became obedient to God. And then the Spirit was sealed, uh, came to seal them. That's an important thought. Hold on to it in your mind. And so, even according to the context, that, op that idea of the direct operation of the Holy Spirit can't be true. Second thing that sometimes is put forth is 
not the direct operation of the Holy Spirit, but the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. A personal ind- in other words, the Holy Spirit inhabits the body of man in some way, not a miraculous way that's taught by many of our, um, you know, n- none of our brothers in Christ that I know of understand and, and would teach a miraculous way, but somehow the Spirit comes in and dwells in the body of man. Well, what did Jesus say the primary role of the Spirit was? All the way back in his day, John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you. Can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. We will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak, and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. Seems that the primary reason Jesus was sending the Spirit back was to guide the apostles, and therefore us, into all truth. And not only that, but according to Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, the sign that they were speaking the truth was that they'd be able to perform many signs. What were they? Picking up serpents, uh, casting out demons, speaking in new tongues, drinking deadly poison, it wouldn't hurt them. Laying their hands on the sick, they would recover. All of those things that we see that the apostles were able to do and others upon whom they laid their hands were able to do after Acts chapter number 2. Now, if Ephesians chapter 1 is teaching us the primary roles of each member of the Godhead and the primary role of the Spirit is to reveal and confirm the Word, then it's very unlikely that this sealing has to do with the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit in every believer. And so what is it that Paul is talking about? There's a third possibility, and that is the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit in the first century to confirm the Word of God. Just what Jesus said would happen in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 in 18. Now, how do I know that? What proof do I have? All we need to do is go back to the beginning of the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 19, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the Indian country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What was their answer? Well, their answer was this. uh, We don't even, haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, wait a minute. I want you to go back and think about verse number 2 there for just a second. Paul says, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What? came first in the lives of these men who are there at Ephesus. Their faith in Christ as the Savior. They hadn't received any Holy Spirit yet. Isn't that what we just pointed out out of Ephesians chapter 1? That the belief, the hearing of the word came first, the belief came next, and then the sealing of the Spirit came. Did you receive it? No, we haven't even heard. And so he said unto what then were you baptized? They said John's baptism. Paul said John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That's Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them... The Holy Spirit came on them. And what were they able to do? Continue reading. They began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There's your signs again. And so we have again the revelation and the confirmation of the Word of God by the Spirit. Those folks that at Ephesus could know that they were in Christ. 
and that the preaching that had been done to them was true because of what those men such as Paul who came, these men, the ones that Paul had converted and laid his hands upon them because of the things that they could do. Their guarantee was there. They weren't believing a myth. It was the truth. And so the Spirit seal, uh, sealed the plans. Very quickly as we come to a close, and notice you may note that you have one more blank on your sheet. We'll fill that one in. That's simply this. Though these three distinct personalities are equally God in their essence, they're not equal in authority. What do you mean? Don't they have equal authority? They're all God. You remember Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and said to them, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Where? Everywhere there is. Even in heaven and on earth, it's been given to me. In John 16, verses 12 and 13, Jesus pointed out, I still have many things to say to you, talking to His apostles, but you can't bear them right now, so I'm going to send the Spirit. What happens when the Spirit comes? The Spirit of truth? Well, He'll speak, won't speak on, will not speak on His own authority, verse 13. Whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He'll take what is Mine... And declare it to you. He spoke through the authority of Jesus. But in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 24 through 28. Paul writes about a time when Jesus. Who now has all authority. Will deliver the kingdom to God the Father. He goes on, he says in verse number 25, for he must reign until he has put his enemies. He's got his authority until all of God's plan for mankind is accomplished. But very quickly, you drop down to verse 28. And the Bible says, when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to him. And put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. What's the point? When he delivers the kingdom back to the Father, even Jesus himself will become subject again to him. He'll put down his ruling authority. So very quickly this morning as we close... The Bible presupposes God, one God with three distinct personalities. They're all deity, but with different roles and different authority, working together to accomplish God's purpose. Right now is the time for the sun to shine. Oh, not the sun outside, the sun of the Father. Right now, it's His time. It's His kingdom. Right now, we're under His authority. One day, He'll deliver the kingdom back to God, according to 1 Corinthians 15. My question to you this morning is this. When Jesus delivers His kingdom back to the Father, will you be a part of it? Will you take advantage of the plan that God laid out for us? That Jesus enacted for us? And that the Holy Spirit, by His revelation to the apostles, by the, idea, by the, by the, uh, uh, the miraculous power that was imparted to them through Him to prove that they were indeed the Son of, that, that they were indeed teaching the truth, would you accept that plan? To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Make the great confession. Be immersed for the remission of your sins. Maybe today that there's one or more 
who's here who needs to do that so that you can be a part of that kingdom so that when God the Father does receive it back from the Son that you'll be a part of it. If you're here this morning and in the past you've become a part of that kingdom but you have strayed away, you've allowed yourself to to take over the authority of your own life and rejected the authority of Jesus in it, you've sinned. You need to come back to Him. If you have a need this morning, whatever it may be, why don't you come right now?